Take your hymnals, please. Turn to number 246 and please stand. 246.
We are glad that you are all here today to come together and, and uh, lift the name of Christ on high and uh, to glorify him. I sure hope that you realize that Jesus is still on the throne, that he is the one that we keep our focus on. It's good as Christians for us to understand what's going on out in this world. I, I truly believe that. But let's not get captivated by those things and let's keep our focus on Christ. Because one day he will come back. And I hope you're prepared for his coming. He will call you home and will be in the presence of Christ. That's our hope. That is a certainty. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you have that hope. What a glorious hope that is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we come to you today and thank you again for this day that you've given to us that we can lift your name on high. And we know that there's many things that are distracting us or could distract us as Christians that are going on around us. And help us as believers in Jesus Christ to do the job that you have for each and every one of us. I don't believe that you call us to be silent on issues. I don't believe that you call us to be silent on sin. I, I believe that you call us to repent from those things and to go out into the world and share the gospel and to make disciples. Father, we know that there's a world looking for you. They just don't realize it. Help us to be the light and the salt that you call us to be. Help us to put your name and glorify, glorify your name today. Whatever your will is for our lives, I pray that we would set ours aside and start living for you. Father, we know that our, our country is in much turmoil, and I pray over godly principles. I pray that you be back on the throne. I pray that we'd fall to our knees and, and claim you as Lord in our lives. We're not looking for somebody. We're looking for you to be Lord. Father, again, thank you for this day that you've given to us. I pray over pastor and I pray for the message that we are about to receive and I pray that our hearts will be attentive to it. And Father, I know that the evil one wants to come and distract and destroy what, what, we're, what we're doing today. He has no part in or business being in here. We pray against his powers. We pray against him. And we ask all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. You may be seated. A few things I'd like to bring before you at this time. We, this last uh, week we had VBS. And we want to thank each and every one of you that took part in that, that helped uh, help that out. So we, we really appreciate it. It takes a lot of effort to put one of these things on. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to keep up with these kids, doesn't it? Uh, I, I know. I mean, I, I, as, as a kid and, and we were running from baseball or football and my parents were running me around, I had no idea what kind of toll that took on them. Now I do. Now I do, for sure. But we appreciate all the help that you guys put into it. Uh, it's such a great thing that, that we have here in this church. A few things to uh, be mindful of. Of course, today, don't forget that uh, communion. So I pray that you've been obedient and, and allowing God to reveal in you um, uh, anything that might be hindering a close walk with you, with him. So uh, remind, reminder of that. Also, July 22nd is discipleship, clip, discipleship class at 7 o'clock in the church basement. July 24th is the prayer meeting at 7 o'clock. And July 28th, we will be having a business meeting following the morning service. A few things coming up in August there uh, to be mindful of. Of course, uh, we got putt-putt and then uh, Eden Day's and then um, uh, Pat's story will be uh, with us. And the other thing there, August 18th, I want, I want to put a reminder in there. Uh, we will be doing the baptism, and that will be at Terry and Trina's place. Those are the things, and of course there's much other stuff go going on here, but those are the things I wanted to highlight. Is there any other things 
uh, that need to be brought forward at this time. All right. Is there any? Yes, Crystal. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. I just wanted to give an update on LifeWise Academy and Eden. We've gotten a lot of signatures, so thank you for that. We do have the United Methodist Church at Eden is willing to host it. We're also talking to St. Peter's Church, so maybe both of them can maybe both host or we can figure something out. Um, and then we meet with the superintendent on August 1st, so be in prayer about that, uh, that that goes well in the day. We can get this approved right away um, to get this going. So um, I'll keep you guys updated as we, we move along this process, and hopefully we can bring Likewise Academy to you this year. Thank you. Uh, is there any anything else? Anything else? All right, is there any birthdays? Anniversaries? All right, Colleen. Take your notes one more time, please. Turn to 257. 257, please stand.
You may be seated. At this time, Sydney and Brody has a special. And so I purposely listened to it on YouTube. I thought, hey, it's a little different than I usually listen to. However, the message was terrific. And so I thought, how can I bridge this? How can I make what some of the young people listen to today kind of make sense for me and for some of the rest of you? And so I uh, worked on it a little bit, and Brody was willing to work with me on it. And so we have a song we'd like to share with you today. But first I'm going to read some scripture, which will really help explain the meaning of this song. This is taken out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet, and he was being given lots of instructions by God. And this is all about the dry bones in the valley. This is Ezekiel 37, verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy, say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. What that made me think of is even though that was a different time, the word of God is not stagnant. It is true yesterday, today, and forever. And it made me think of today, no, we don't look out and see dry bones in our valleys, in our fields. But we, until we know Christ, are walking dead men. I know that's a pretty harsh description of who we are. But until we know Christ Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we are walking dead men. And when he puts his spirit into us, he pulls us out of the grave. So this song is called Grave Robert.
grave robber, pick me up from that rock bottom, wash my soul in that holy water, brought me back to life. One more stone rolled away, one more sinner been saved by grace. This dead man, he ain't dead no longer, all because of that grave robber. Maybe you're the one thinking that you'll never be right, even though your mama praying for you every night. Praying Jesus is gonna grant you and open your eyes. Well, maybe right now is that time. Like a thief in the night, he'll sneak in, take your life. I'm gonna have you singing. I got stolen, got a grave robber. Pick me up from that rock bottom. Wash my soul in that holy water. Brought me back to life. One more stone rolled away. One more sinner been saved by grace. This dead man, he ain't dead no longer. All because of that. Grave robber, take my sin, take my shame, breaking my soul out of these chains. I'm a dead working, and God did it. Take my shame, take my shame, breaking my soul out of these chains. I'm a dead man. Pick me up from that rock bottom Wash my soul in that holy water Brought me back to life One more stone rolled away One more sin have been saved by grace This dead man, he ain't dead no longer All because of that grave robber Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. That, that uh, scares me to death to do something like that. I can't carry a tune in the bucket. So, At this time, Junior Church is dismissed. Cindy, appreciate that. That was an excellent job. Excellent job. Appreciate that. Good message in that song. Tremendous message. Hope you listen to it well. We've been studying in this whole thing called the Prophet Series, and I'm just amazed at how much of the word that we read that is referenced to the prophets. Over and over, there's either sayings that they said, messages they delivered, lessons that they learned that just relates to these special men that God raised up, and you will find prophetess, ladies, that God raised up to proclaim his word, proclaim his message. And I just want to continue on with this theme of thought that we had last Sunday morning, the worth of a soul. And by the way, we just had a great Bible school. We had a whole bunch of people that plugged into the ministry here at this church and the ministry of these boys and girls. And let me tell you, it takes a lot of energy, does it not? And there's a lot of people following those kids around, herding them, working with them, teaching them various stations, feeding them, playing games with them and doing crafts with them, and at the end of the week, they all said, we made it. But it's been good. It's been just a great week for the boys and girls. They sat under the Word all week long. They've had great promotions provided for them, and the numbers grew throughout the course of the week, and that was a good thing. And I just praise the Lord for the faithfulness of this church and the men and women who plugged into this ministry, who made it a point to be here, because I will assure you not every one of them were spring chickens. There was some of them in there that was been around a while. And uh, they needed a lot of strength to make it through. But they did, and the Lord has honored it and blessed it. And we capped it off with the final night. Randall Judy, our Gideon, who's been here, he came and he dispersed Bibles as boys and girls, or New Testaments as boys and girls made their way out of the sanctuary. So it was just a great, great week. And we just thank you for your prayers been talking about the worth of a soul. Every soul is of great value. If you remember back in the book of Mark chapter 8, we began there last week, 
And we said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, verse 36, and lose his own soul? Jesus oftentimes spoke to the wealthy, spoke to the rich, and he admonished them that their riches were not going to bring them eternal happiness. They might have a little happiness here in their yacht and in their great cars that they buy and their motorcycles that they drive and the vacations that they take. But at the end of this life, they're going to leave it all behind. And they're going to go out of life. If they don't know Jesus Christ, they're going to go out of this life as a pulper. And the Lord here says in his word, now what are you going to give the Lord when you leave this life and you exit out into eternity? What are you going to give the Lord when you go out into eternity in exchange for your soul? There's nothing of this world that you have that you say is yours that you can possibly give to God that he doesn't already have. The only thing that you can give to God that will rescue your soul is your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. As you go on you read verse 37, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's, as we dig into this a little bit more this morning and prepare our heart for communion and review just a little bit where we were and then enlarge upon it, let's just pray that the Lord uses that to minister to all of our hearts today because I hope in this congregation everybody's saved. But I'm smart enough to know that I've gone to church long enough to know that there's good imposters. How do I know that? Well, there was a man by the name of Judas. He was a pretty good imposter, wasn't he? And uh, Jesus gave the sop, they dipped it in the, whatever they were dipping it into, and they gave it to, Ju uh, to Judas, and Judas was the imposter in the 12 that had faked his way through until Jesus gave the sop to him. He went out and departed into the night, and the Satan entered into him, and you know the story how Judas was used of the enemy to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. My point is, very possibly in this congregation this morning, there are men and women that are good like Judas, that faking it with their mouth, saying the right thing. But really in their heart, they have never surrendered their all to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say to you, what are you going to give to the Lord in that day? When your life is taken from you, when just life is lived and you're dead and you die and you go out into eternity, where will you spend eternity? What do you have to give to the Lord? You've never given your heart to Him. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for the Word that we're about to digest this morning. Help us to digest the truth of Your Word into our heart, into our soul, that which You have placed within us, to know You, to fear You, to love You, to serve You. Help us, Lord, to understand that we need to personally have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, for we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We were in Mark, as I said last week, and we talked about the soul. What about the soul? Well, we said the soul is that part of us that God created in us to be eternal. We don't see the soul, but you see what the soul holds to by what the body does. You see that. We don't see the soul, and yet it's seen by what the body does. And we didn't reference in Genesis 1.27, but Genesis 1.27 said this, God created us in His image. What does that mean, God created us in His image? We were created, first and foremost, to love God. God created us to love Him. God created us to know Him. God created us to walk with God, to serve God. God created us to be holy, like unto God. God created us to live eternally with God. In His image, we were called to be righteous, but in His image, He did something else. He gave us a free will. Every one of you this morning has a free will. You can choose to obey the Lord or you can choose not to obey the Lord. And some of you probably have chosen this past week not to obey the Lord. But the more you grow and become like the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you desire to be holy unto Him, the more you want to obey Him. I came across something written by A.W. Tozer. I thought it was good. He said, the Christian cannot be certain of the reality and the depth of his love until he comes face to face with the commandment of Christ and is forced to decide what to do about them. You pick up this book and you read this book and you read what God expects of you and me if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will double dog, I use this word loosely, bet you that throughout the course of your day, throughout the course of your life, you will come to terms with the commandment of Almighty God the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you're going to have to decide at that moment in time just how serious you are about being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you go out on a date, when you go out with the fellas, when you're out there on that ball team playing with the 
the, those lost guys out there in the world. Anybody ever played with lost guys out in the world, ball teams, various things like that? I did. And I'll tell you what, they're lo- they, they call them lost for, for a good reason. They're lost. They're worldly. They're ungodly. You're going to have to decide as a Christian what you're going to do with the word that you have heard. Will I obey the Lord or will I disobey the Lord? You see, when you were created in the image of God, gave you, God gave you a free will. God didn't create you to be a little robot to walk around like this to do what he told you. He wanted you to do what he wanted you to do out of the love of your heart. He wanted you to obey him out of the love of your heart. So God created man. The scriptures record in Genesis chapter 2. He created him out of the dust of the ground. And in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says, He breathed into this creation of man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that first man that God created, God said, This is good. This is good. This is the, this is the greatness of my creation. If all that he created in this world was good, but when he created the man, he said, this is good. And the man that God created was good. Why? Because sin had not entered the soul of man. But at some point in time, before man was created, God created Satan. And Satan was a high angel, and he was created to serve God. He was an exalted angel. But he revolted against God. He declared himself as, he wanted to declare himself as God, to be like God. And he revolted against God. And in so doing, he took with him a host of angels that became known as demon spirits. And what did God do? Well, God prepared a place for Satan and his demon spirits one day where they're going to make their final abode. We call that hell. One day they're going to be ushered out of the pit of hell before the great white throne judgment, just like you and I are. And they're going to, or the great white throne judgment where the lost will stand. And they will be thrown out eventually into the lake of fire. But God's creation that God created initially was good. But Satan comes along and Satan attacks this world that God created. And the first attack that Satan placed his bony hook into was the soul of man, was Adam and Eve. If you remember the story in the garden. And what did he do? He came and he tempted them. At that point, they chose to sin. And at that point, all of humanity was destined to eternal separation from God just exactly like Satan was going to be eternally separated from God. So Satan's greatest accomplishment was when he deceived the soul of man. Man in his own free will chose to sin against God. And at that point in time, the image that God created in man ceased to glorify God. Ceased to glorify God. Ceased to glorify the one that created. We we became like the one who deceived us. And we became sin. And now because of our sin, we are destined to eternal separation from God. Fellowship has been broken with Almighty God. But as I read in the Word of God, I read the result of that sin back in the book of Romans chapter 5. Take your Bible and look with me in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 19, it says this. It says, for by one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall be many be made righteous. Because of one man's sin, many were made, it says here, were made sinners. That's the results of one man's sin. Many were made sinners. When sin entered the world, what happened? Well, it tarnished humanity in our soul. It tarnished us from the very time of our birth. We entered into this world. We're born into this world as sinners, little babies. Sometimes they say, well, aren't they little angels? Well, no, they're not. Not really. They're little sinners. They just don't know it yet, but they're little sinners. They, you will know it if you don't already know it. It won't take you long. You'll find out they're little sinners. Uh, they will stir things up in you that you didn't know you had inside of you because of the nature that is with inside of those little fellows and little ladies that are born into this world. They're born into this world of sinners. All of humanity has been tarnished by sin. Ten, what has sin done? It has tarnished our intellect to seek God. It has tarnished our will to obey God. It has tarnished our speech to praise God, and it has tarnished our fear of God. We no longer fear God. Look at our world this morning. We're living in a world this morning where men do not fear God. They're shaking their fist at the face of holy God. Like Pharaoh of old said, who is God that I should obey him? So sin has tarnished all of humanity, and Satan is rejoicing because that was his goal. But oh, the love of God. The God of heaven who created man 
in his image. And that man now is estranged from God because sin has entered the heart and soul of man. But the love of God that looked over the banister of heaven and says, oh, I cannot stand this. And what did God do? God so loved the world that he created. He was not willing. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he was not willing that any man should perish. He was determined to provide a way. Remember this, God is a way maker. God made a way for fallen men to come to him. And how did he do that? Well, we're going to talk about this morning in the Lord's table. He did it through what we see in the elements of the Lord's table, the bread and the cup. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, who epitomizes the bread and the cup. The Lord Jesus Christ came and to die on the cross for the sins of men. God is a way maker. But you know, the old devil looked at God and he said, well, these souls are mine. I've deceived these souls. They followed after me. They're not going to follow after you. They're not going to serve you. They're mine. And God says, yes, Satan, way back in Genesis chapter 3, God says, yes, Satan, you, def you definitely bruised the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When sin entered the world, the plan, when Satan's plan was put in place in this world, it affected all of humanity because look what it says, verse 15, Genesis chapter 3. It says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Lord Jesus Christ was bruised by the attack of Satan. But one day the Lord Jesus Christ was going to come and die upon the cross. That was God's plan. And he was going to crush the head of the serpent. That reminds me, the other day I was out in the yard mowing and I see a snake withering across the driveway, or drip, withering across the lawn. He didn't wither long. He didn't wither long. Now I know there's a lot of people say, well, snakes are good. You can have them at your house all you want. I don't want them in my grouse. It's holy ground, no room for snakes. Stay off my turf. But uh, Satan withered out into the garden one day and he deceived mankind. And because of that, all of mankind was made a sinner. And Satan says, I got my finger, I got my bony hook into the soul of man and these souls are mine. And God said, no, they're not. I'm going to give these souls a chance to repent, a chance to change their ways. And how did God do that? Well, you turn back to the book of 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and you read in verse 8. It says this, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of Satan. God said to Satan, I have a plan. I have a plan. This war that has gone on between God and Satan has gone on for a long time, and Satan has been deceiving the souls of men. But God's plan was to send his son to the cross. And there at the cross, he would fight a battle between darkness and between light. And the Lord Jesus Christ won the battle, as you well know, at the cross and made a way for fallen sinners to be saved. He brought back fallen man back into fellowship with God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. At the cross, he became my way maker. At the cross, when I trusted him as my Lord and Savior, I was saved as the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, to the uttermost. What did he do? He took my condemnation and provided for me justification. His shed blood provided for me redemption for my soul, my soul which is estranged from God because of sin. Because when I come to him and receive him as my Lord and as my Savior, I can be brought back into fellowship, brought back into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's something else he did for me at the cross. At the cross, he broke the shackles of sin that enslaved me. I want you to know this morning that if you're a lost person here this morning and don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, sin enslaves you. It will control you. It will have rulership over you. But when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that sin that enslaved you, that shackled you, those shackles are broken at the cross. Today we celebrate the Lord's table, and this table tells the story that I've just told you. We celebrate this in the elements of what we're about to take. The cup, the cup speaks to the blood which Jesus shed for our sins, making possible our redemption. Look what it says in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says this, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. Remember the rich man we talked about last week in Luke chapter 16 who died and the scripture says he went to hell. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. 
Remember what we talked about last week about hell being a place of torment, fire and brimstone and anguish and anguish and, and, and gnashing of teeth, all of that taking place in hell. Men in hell would give all that they had if they could escape the suffering of hell. But notice as it says, you are not redeemed with the corruptible things as silver and gold. You're not going to have your soul ever redeemed by that which you're able to accomplish here. How? But with your, but he says, redeemed by silver and gold from your vain conversation received from tradition from your fathers. Many fathers have passed on to their children, well, if you just be a good person, you'll go to heaven. Many fathers have passed on to their children, well, if you just be a moral person, you'll go to heaven. Or if you just go to church, you'll go to heaven. Men and women can go to church, be moral, and be a good person, die and go to a sinner's hell. Why? Because they have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. They have not depended upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith to take away their sin. Look what it says. He says, verse 19, he says, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot. God said to Satan one day, he said, you bruised the heel of my son, but one day my son is going to come and crush the head of Satan. Amen. What does that mean? He's going to come and crush the head of Satan. How's he going to do it? He's going to do it through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of this cross and because of this blood, Satan has become a defeated foe. He has become a defeated foe. You no longer have to be a slave to sin. You no longer have to be shackled by the shackles of sin. You have power in the power of the Holy Spirit to rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus. You have power to overcome him because of the blood of Jesus. And you have power to live victoriously because of the Holy Spirit indwelling you because of the cross of Lord Jesus Christ. When you take that cup this morning, you're declaring by faith, your faith, that Jesus Christ is your Savior. The Bible says back in the book of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man has to come to that point that he has to see and understand that he's a sinner, that he's missed the mark, that he has fallen short. Every last one of us, we're born into this world as sinners, and every last one of us are going to have to make a decision. Either we're going to accept the Lord Jesus or we're going to turn from the Lord Jesus. It grieves my heart. I don't know about you, but it grieves my heart. When I read the funeral, the page, the death page in the, in the paper, and I read through there, and I see that there are those that do not have any kind of a service of any kind. No cemetery service, no public service. Now, I understand people don't want to have a public service. They want to have a cemetery service. Just say a few words about the Lord and so forth and about my life, and that's good. Well, that's fine. But there are some that don't even want to have any kind of a service. And there was one that I seen that I used to work with in the, in the factory. And there was no service that I could see in the paper. I reread it a couple times. There was no service. It grieves my heart that these men and women don't want to have an opportunity for the Word of God to be, be proclaimed in some form, some fashion, that the men and women who come and watch have, have known this individual don't want to hear the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friend, this morning, when you come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, His blood washes away that sin. His blood makes you a part of the family of the redeemed. And so when we take that cup this morning, we need to take it reverently. We've been talking about worship on Sunday night. We've been talking about reverence on Sunday night. We've been talking about the various names of God on Sunday night and how we need to reverence, reverence the name of Almighty God. We don't treat it as common. We don't treat it as ordinary. This is not a common, ordinary service. This is something that we do very seriously because what Jesus Christ did at the cross, he did it because God so loved the world and he was not willing that any one of us should ever perish, but that every one of us would have the opportunity to be born again and to become a child of the king, to have the shackles of sin that held us to be broken at the cross. But then we look at the bread. The bread speaks to the broken body of the Lord Jesus, which was broken for you. What did Jesus say of himself? He said, I'm the bread of life. And he exhorted men to partake of that bread of life. His word, when taken in, is like bread for strength for the journey of life. It strengthens us. If we don't ever take in the word of God, we'll never have strength to live powerfully for the Lord. You know, when you go back and you read in the book of Exodus chapter 12, let's go back here for just a moment. Exodus chapter 12. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 12. 
that Passover, when they first took the Passover, there's something there that I want you to see in verse 7. It says this, it says, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two sides of the post and on the upper doorpost of the house wherein they shall eat it. You know the story, the Passover. The Jewish nation observed the Passover yearly. What was the Passover? Well, the blood was placed upon the doorpost in faith. And by doing that, the firstborn in the family was spared from the death angel that passed over. In Egypt, they experienced death because they didn't believe by God by faith and placed blood on the doorpost. You realize this morning, that I am convinced there's a lot of men and women that have placed the blood on the doorpost, but they've missed out on another element of what they are to do. Yes, they are saved, but they're not growing in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, they are saved, but they live a feeble Christian experience out there in the world. They are a pawn, oftentimes. Yes, they can point their finger to a time in Bible school or a time at the altar or some church, some revival service. But they just don't seem to have that element of great strength to be able to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night and roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. What did Jesus say of himself? He said, I'm the bread of life. He exhorted men to partake of that bread of life. You can be saved and know that you're saved, but if you don't partake of the Word of God daily, regularly, in your spiritual life, you'll not have strength for the journey of life. Do you understand that this morning? You'll live a feeble Christian experience. You'll be less than what God ordained you to be. You will not be living the abundant Christian life that God wants you to live if you don't partake of his word on a regular basis. These men and women were to eat the flesh. Why? Because the journey that was before them, it would provide strength for the journey. Yes, you can be saved by faith through grace because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but there's another element there. If you're going to live victoriously, if you're going to live victoriously and live the kind of life he wants you to live, then you need to partake of the bread of life. That bread, that broken body symbolically speaks to the Word of God, how the Word of God strengthens you and I for the journey of life, helps us to be strong and overcoming as a believer. So the Lord's table speaks to our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. What did I read earlier? I read a quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, the Christian cannot be certain of the reality of the depth of his love until he comes face to face with the commandment of Christ and is forced to decide what to do about them. If you have been partaking of the bread of life that we find in the Word of God, if you've been partaking of the Word of God and allowing it to feed and nourish your eternal soul, it will give you strength for the journey of life. It will give you the power to overcome the temptations and the testings that will come your way, and they will come your way in this broken world. But you have to be in the Word, and if you're not in the Word, you're going to become a victim. You're not going to live the abundant Christian life. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I have trusted the Lord as my Savior, but you will not live victoriously. You will not be a, a, an epistle that men can know and read and be pointed to Jesus Christ. Why? Because you've lived a feeble existence. There are individuals that have an eating disorder. We say they're anorexic. There are Christians that can become spiritually anorexic. They don't look healthy. They're not healthy. Why? Because they don't get into the Word. Why? When given a commandment from the things of God, from His Word, what do they do about it? Well, they decide to do what they want to do. The Bible said in the book of Judges, men did that which was right in their own eyes. And men decide to live their life the same way even after they've trusted Christ as their Savior because they haven't been in the Word and the Word keeps us, keeps us to, uh, close to the cross. I've oftentimes said that when you come to the Lord and trust Him as your Lord and Savior, you and I can't drift very far from the cross because if we drift far from the cross, we're going to find ourselves drifting far from the commandments of His Word. Our, our, our step, our testimony, and all that we profess is not going to be that which would bring glory and honor to God. That's why we need to be in the Word every day, every day in the Word. I don't know the condition of your heart this morning, but the God of heaven knows the condition of your heart. And if you're here this morning and don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, we want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's very simple. 
Very simple. You can cry out to him and invite him into your heart and life. Repent of your sins. Say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've missed the mark. I know I've fallen short. And I do not want to die and go to a sinner's hell. I want to trust you as my Lord and Savior. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior. And I trust you today. I believe you came and died and was buried. And you rose again for my justification. You can pray a prayer to that end. And mean it in your heart. And the God of heaven will come into your heart and life. The Bible says, though, that after we have confessed Christ as our Savior, we should not be ashamed to confess Him before men. And so if you're here and you've trusted the Lord, you've never confessed Him before men, we want to give you that opportunity as well today. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Father, we thank You for the Word this morning. We pray that it finds a lodging place in each of our hearts. We pray, Father, this morning that as we take this table that we've examined ourselves. That we don't take this table, as your word tells us, unworthily. Should there be those in our midst here this morning that perhaps never have trusted you as their Lord and Savior, I pray, God, in the quietness of this hour, that they will take you into their heart and life and receive you as their Lord and Savior. They will pray that prayer in confession of their sin, in repentance, and calling out to you to come into their heart and life. Perchance there's those here this morning, Lord, that are Christians, but they have lived feeble Christian experience. They're living beneath their privilege. They're not living the abundant life. There's not much joy. There's not much happiness in their Christian life because they haven't been in your word. They haven't fed their eternal soul. And I pray, Father, this morning that the word would speak to their hearts as well, that you would challenge them to recommit themselves to be obedient to you and to your word. For we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnal this morning and turn to page 381. <clears throat> and let's all stand, shall we? <clears throat> It's very possible that if you've lived your life and be sitting here in this sanctuary,
to not know the Lord as your Savior and the Spirit of God's prick in your heart, I encourage you to cry out to Him, invite Him into your heart and life to be your Savior. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. I'm going to ask the elders to come and take their place at this time. If the elders would come and I.